All right, well, hello again. It's good to see you again. I am super excited to, uh, to share this uh, sermon with you today. And um, it's called To Be or To Do. Does God call us to be with him or does he call us to work for him? And you may not totally clue into that, but that is really where we're going this fall. And uh, beginning today, today's kind of an introduction and then um, we're going to get deeper into this topic from this book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. How many people have read that one? Okay, we got a couple. You'll get to do a review. I was hoping a lot of hands weren't going to go up right there. So um, We've been really talking about this for a few months, praying about it, looking at it as a staff for the, uh, the summer, really just thinking, man, this is exactly what we need and the right time that we need it. And I know it's exactly what I need. I'm hoping it's going to be what what everybody needs. Um, And you may be looking for Roy and Alicia today. They they were speaking in Riverside uh, this morning, and then they're at a friend's uh, engagement engagement party today. So Jordan Whitcomb, if some of you know her, her grandparents are out here, so they come out here every once in a while. Uh, But uh, this... On Tuesday, Danielle and I have a special uh, day here. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary. And so it's, it's pretty, it's just amazing to reflect on all that God has bringing, uh, brought you through in, in, in your years together. And uh, we went to celebrate up in Northern California this week, and we made a playlist on the way up there of all the songs that kind of represented different parts of our lives. And I think we got to like four and a half hours of songs. We almost got all the way up there with that. Uh, But just thinking how much God uh, brings us through. And in the spirit of the sermon today, I was just kind of reflecting on Psalm 138.1. He says, I praise you, Lord, with all my heart. And one of the things that he even recommends in the book is to just think about one sentence scripture for like 15 minutes. And it's kind of hard to do. If you've ever done that before, you kind of get lost and you start thinking about what you got to do and you're like, how many times can I praise the Lord and I run out of things to praise him for in just 15 minutes, it's hard to do. But it it showed me just how much there is to be grateful for. You know, we can can even take uh, for granted the people that we're around all the time, our spouses, our friends, our family, and even just recognize that, man, I have so much to be grateful for, I just don't often take enough time to think about it and stop for long enough to really remember. And uh, it's amazing. I'm going to be kind of... pitching this book a little bit today, but we're, get, we're going to read the Bible today too, okay? So you're going to give me a little latitude. I, I just ask for a little latitude. Right. I know when somebody tells me about a great book they're reading, some of you are already looking it up and maybe you've already bought it, <laughs> right? I'm the type of person that once somebody starts, I'm going, oh, I wonder why they're so excited about it. There's so many books out there. Why would I, why would I want to read this one? <laughs> you know, and so my encouragement is to look at it and start looking at it, see if it doesn't connect with you. Because that's kind of how I was when I started, and the more I started reading, I go, man, this is really, this is really uh, hitting me right where I need it uh, these days. And Peter Scazzaro, he's not from our family of churches, but when you read his story, he sure sounds like one of us. The same struggles. All, so many people that have gone to churches their whole lives, they end up having the same struggle, and a lot of it comes down to right here. Am I a worker for God, or do I spend time? Do I spend time with God enough to support all that I'm trying to do for God? And for most Christians in America, the answer is no. For most of us in this room, including me, the answer is probably no. That we do a lot for God, and a lot of times we don't have the, the, the spiritual support behind it. So hopefully this will motivate us to be more balanced in our walk with God And I believe God has a lot of things that he wants us to accomplish. But once that is over, then we're going to be with God forever. And I think he wants us to be with him now, too. Not just work for him and then go be with him. No, he wants us to be with him now and let us work for him out of that spirit. Or you could think about Jesus. Is he an 
Do you have a real relationship with him, or are you an employee of Jesus? You know, and you're, you're like, okay, I did, I did my job description. I, I checked the boxes that I'm supposed to do. How am I doing? Or you could think about it another way where Jesus said to his disciples, I don't call you servants. I call you friends. Amen. You know, you're not workers for me in that sense. You're, you're close. We're, we want to hang out. We want to spend time. And I, th- this analogy has been, you know, used so much, but the idea of the... Of the the iceberg, where only 10% is above the surface. What we see, what, what we're wearing, what we look like, our, our resume, our credentials, that's what people see. But there's so much that God sees and maybe we're not even aware. You ever had someone come up to you and tell you something about you that they know but you don't yet? There's so much that God wants us to be aware of And you may be thinking, wow, finally, we need to get deeper. The people around me need to get deeper. They're so shallow. We need to get down there. And and you're just like, man, this is going to be the best fall ever. I I can't wait. I want us to all grow. And you may be more like me going, oh, no. I don't know about this. I don't know if I'm ready to go. I don't know what I'm going to find down there. That we're trained to push that stuff down until it becomes a problem, but God wants us to look at it so that we can really bring things to him. And I'm going to share a few things just that I've been learning as I've been reading this to hopefully inspire you. But one of my fears was like, okay, if we start getting all deep, then we're not going to really share our faith with others, right? Because we're going to be so busy looking at ourselves that we're not even... I want to just stop that right here that when you're deep with God, when you're with God, you care more about people. When you're able to share what's going on in your life, you're able to connect and relate to people that are struggling and hurting, and you know they might not even know why or what's going on, but the more in touch we are, the better we're going to be. Jesus was a pretty deep guy, wouldn't you say? He could, give you, he could just give you one sentence, and you would, it would be exactly what you needed. That wasn't just by accident. That was because he knew himself. Therefore, he knew them. Obviously, he had a little advantage. He could read minds and things. <laughs> but I know that uh, this has happened to me, and maybe it's happened to you at times. Sometimes I either purposely or un- unconsciously or consciously avoid time with God because I don't want to deal because I know there's a lot of stuff going on. I know that I'm feeling a lot of stuff. And when you take time to spend with God, the layers start coming off and your true self comes out. And a lot of times what we do is we go like this. Because it's scary. We don't want to be honest. And yet my encouragement for us is to keep looking. Be healed. Allow God to come into places in your life that you never thought that he would make it into. Maybe you're feeling like you're not close to anyone. You don't have real, true friendships. I guarantee you, if you start getting deep and sharing those things, you're going to have better friendships. Because people are, are going through the same things. You feel like, maybe people don't understand me. Maybe your spouse is saying you don't talk enough. They're not saying you don't talk. They're saying you don't get deep. It's not the words, the schedules, uh, you know, counting them up. It's what are we sharing with one another? How are we connecting with each other? And obviously, there's a time to be deep and there's a time to have fun. We don't want to be deep all the time. But this, this is going to be a, a season in our lives when I think God is helping us to get deeper. What have I realized so far about myself? I realize I have a lot of fear. It's everywhere. It's, it's all over the place. Every day, all the time, multiple times a day. What do people expect from me? Am I going to let people down? What happens if that, I don't get with this person this week and they really want to? And you start thinking about that multiplied by 200 people. And you go, man, that's a lot of pressure. To, and I don't want you to feel pressure. I want you to 
I want you to, I want, I want to be approachable, but just the idea of expectations that we have for one another. Expectations that we have as a, uh, from even other ministers and other, other members and even within my own self that we can't live up to. And there's a lot of fears that go along there. I've realized different relationships that need more attention, that aren't getting what they need, the close ones. I've realized other relationships that I need to fix, and I've shared that with the brothers in our time. And so my, my, I know for a fact, as you start slowing down and being with God, that you're going to go through the same types of things. There's going to be some fears that will come up. There's going to be some relationships, either close ones or ones maybe from far away that you need to fix. We're going to need to be peacemakers with each other. We're going to need to help meet each other's needs, even if they're not where we are. They don't think like we think. And maybe it's things even within our own family that we need to prioritize and we need to think more about. I'm just sharing these things to kind of get you start to think, what is under the surface? You know, what's in that 90%? And I don't, anybody have a, a TV show that you're into, that you're watching? Uh, probably all the rest of you do too. You just don't raise your hands. But I appreciate the zeal of those that raise your hand. Aaron, way to go. Uh, but I've been watching this show alone, and uh, this will connect with all of my outdoor people out there like JJ and others, um, but they basically send 10 people out to the Arctic Circle. They're five miles apart, at least from each other, and they have no human contact, and the goal is to be out there 100 days. And it, Some of you are thinking, why would you ever want to do that? I was thinking that too, but man, this is pretty amazing. They go out there and have to survive, and there's no camera crew. They do all their own camera stuff. Um, but one of the things that really impressed me, two of the people, and can you imagine how much thinking you're going to do if you're out there by yourself for 100 days? That's, that's ultimately what happens to people. They either starve to death or they can't deal with whatever it is that comes up. And one, two of the people that left, they shared as they were leaving, they said, you know what? I already have everything I want. They're going out there. They're trying to win a million dollars. They want all this stuff, and they realize, you know what? I have a great life. And I couldn't help but wonder and just think, man, what would it take for they have to go all the way to the Arctic Circle to realize that they're good? <laughs> and so many of us, we have everything. We want so many things, but when we're really honest, do we really need it? Don't we really have from God, from the everything that he's given us, everything we need. I thought that was a deep uh, thought there. And then uh, this girl, Callie, there was a couple women on there that were just like phenomenal. These girls were hardcore. I was showing, every once in a while, I'd be showing Danielle, like, look at this. And this one girl, Callie, she, I could tell, I knew she was going to be one of the finalists here when she said this. She said, I want to go deeper with nature, and I want to go deeper with myself. And she was all excited about it. And I said, man, that's somebody who's going to go far. That they're willing and excited and ready to go deep with God. And, and, and she wasn't talking about God, but that's what I was thinking about because I'm reading this book and watching this show. And are you ready to really go deep with God? You know, are you ready to make his, the, your relationship with God a, a real priority? Like, even as you think about the fall, do you want to grow spiritually this fall? I'm not just throwing it out there because we ask ourselves that question all the time. We just don't often answer it. And really being willing to put in the work with God to be closer to him. Because I believe if you do that, you will be blown away by what the Lord has ready for us. It's like it's right there, ready to pick. He's just waiting for us to go there. And he's going to help us in an amazing way. I'm going to take a pause here for a minute. We're going to watch a short video from the author. And uh, he's got some really good things to say. 
It's about it's like a five minute video, but I'll I'll take a pause here and then come back after. In Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, we are unpacking two large discipleship spiritual formation themes. These are essential if we are to grow into the men and women in Christ that God intends. The first theme relates to emotional health. It is that emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. It's not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. This flows out of an understanding of what it means that we're created in the image of God. There's different aspects and components of that image, all of which are broken. All need to be transformed by Jesus. We're physical beings, social beings, intellectual beings, spiritual and emotional beings. And discipleship in Christ has to address all these areas. And for many reasons, we've ignored the emotional component. But what we're saying here is that your emotions are a critical part of who you are and therefore must be addressed as part of our discipleship in Christ. At the same time, we're really about loving God, loving God with all our hearts, all our minds, soul, and strength, out of which then we love others. And so the second theme we'll be unpacking in Emotionally Healthy Spirituality relates to what I call contemplative spirituality, or simply being with God. And it really flows out of the story of Mary and Martha found in Luke chapter 10, which as you read, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And you see, we'll notice here, Mary in this passage is sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's listening. She's being with Jesus. She's sitting at his feet. Martha, on the other hand, is active. She's working for Jesus. She's anxious, but she's missing him. She, she's busy. She's distracted. And so we like to call it Mary is contemplating being with Jesus while Martha is active. Our tradition in our churches is rich. We're active. We lead people to Christ. We're about spiritual gifts. We read the scriptures. But we're incredibly active. Where we tend to be weak is in what I like to call our lack of rest or a lack of time for reflection. Being quiet and still before the Lord, sitting at his feet like Mary. And this really impacts not only our own spiritual lives, but the way we build community. And so as you'll notice in this diagram, for many of us, our lives are out of balance. We've got this large activity circle on one end of all the stuff that we're doing in life. And we've got this small circle for what I call contemplation of being with God. And they're out of balance. And so you'll notice the arrow that says your life on the bottom, it's twisted because I don't have enough time of being with God to sustain all I'm doing in life of activity for God. And so what we're trying to do in Emotionally Healthy Spirituality is balance these two circles so that the circle for activity and the circle for contemplation of being with Jesus balances off. And so we've got the right amount of time with God to sustain our doing for God. And so thus the arrow of our life is straight. Things are in proper balance. But when these two are not, we end up like Saul in the Old Testament. If you remember King Saul, on the outside he looked good. He was anointed, he was gifted, but he was emotionally unhealthy. Both his emotional life and his spiritual life were out of order. He wasn't reflective or self-aware emotionally. He wasn't aware of how he was fearful and looking for people's approval, nor did he cultivate his personal relationship with God. He had a head knowledge about God, but not a lot of heart. He was so different than David, who was able, for example, in the Psalms, experience the full range of emotional feelings, yet he was passionate David and had a heart after God. So there are eight principles to emotionally healthy spirituality, and there are eight sessions that are broken down as follows. Session one the problem of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. Session two, know yourself that you may know God. Session three, going back in order to go forward. Session four, journey through the wall. Session five, enlarge your soul through grief and loss. Session six, 
Discover the rhythms of the daily office and Sabbath. Session seven, grow into an emotionally mature adult. And session eight, go the next step to develop a rule of life. Now each of these topics are very large and deep. So our goal, remember, is that during this eight week all church initiative is that you begin, just begin the journey into emotionally healthy spirituality. Finishing it will take a lifetime. If at the end of your time together, you've made one or two steps forward in your journey with Jesus, then it has been a very successful initiative. Most importantly, you will hopefully never follow Jesus Christ in quite the same way. Amen, amen. Well, hopefully you're getting excited. Uh, I am excited about this and really how we're going to grow and how our, even our church culture, I believe, is going to be shifted uh, by this time. And uh, just a little bit of, of the details here, then we're going to get to uh, Mark chapter 10 in a minute. But uh, the next few weeks, next Sunday, we're having a praise and worship Sunday. So I know that's something we do every once in a while where we're going to be able to just praise God and probably dim the lights and sing probably 10 or 10 songs together and take communion and just really have a time to, to worship and, and think about God uh, in that way. And then September 12th, uh, we're going to have kind of the end of our Better Together time. We're going to have a Bring Your Friends Day. Where This is typically where we have celebrated the first responders and we're going to really have a, a time to welcome our friends and just in a way celebrate that we've made it through the past 18 months together. And uh, so feel free to bring your friends that have made the world a better place in the next uh, 18 months. We have called this a hero service in the past. Yeah. We're not calling it that. We're just calling it a friend service because most of us don't think of ourselves as heroes. So <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to that. And then we're going to start kind of our series we, uh, in, on September 19th, You Know Yourself That You May Know God. That's going to be um, kicked off again by Aaron Domingo. And so it gives us a few weeks to kind of buy the books, to start reading, to start thinking about, hey, is this a good series that we're going through? You can be the judge of that. And uh, I think you'll, you'll really enjoy it. So it gives us a little bit of time uh, to, to get, get started there. But I just wanted to give you a, a heads up on what's happening. Now let's say a prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll get going here for today, or continue. Uh, Father, we do thank you so much for this time. I do pray that you uh, help us as a church to keep growing closer to you. Help us as individuals to really uh, be led by your spirit, God. I know that when we're growing and changing, God, it makes our life with you so much more exciting and, and refreshing. And I pray that even today that you get me out of the way, that you can speak uh, through your word, and help us to uh, get closer to you. God, we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So turn over to Mark chapter 10, the passage that he uh, mentioned there about Mary and Martha. I'm going to read it again, even though he just read it. It says, that Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And many of you may be familiar with this passage. And thinking about today, how can we be more like Mary in our lives? You may be thinking that, hey, this is not very realistic. I can't just sit at Jesus' feet all the time that I got stuff to do. And yeah, you're right. It, it's not very realistic to just sit and read your Bible 24-7. Right? If you have kids, you have to take care of your kids. You have to go to work. You got to take care of some stuff. But it's really the heart that Mary had that we're going to take a look at today. And I believe there's a way to be close to Jesus in every life situation. That he provides a way for each one of us to have that connection. 
where we're not running around all over the place, concerned about so many things, but we're sitting at his feet day by day as we go through life. How do we do this? My first point is to simplify. Simplify our lives. And I'm not trying to oversimplify your life, because you know it's not simple. But many of us can make life way too complicated. And we feel like we're so busy running around from here and there. And when you look at Jesus, that is not the way that he lived. Can you imagine Jesus walking in somewhere and go, oh my gosh, it was just such a crazy day and the traffic over there, and this person was bothering me and I'm just so stressed out. <laughs> oh, what do you need? <laughs> I mean, he was never in that place for long. I'm sure he was in that place. But his relationship with God allowed him to not live in that place. In our church, we like to work. We like to serve. We're good at hospitality. We like to share faith. We, we're, we've been known for that for years and years and years. We're not so good at certain things, like the Sabbath. Can you imagine taking 24 hours where you didn't work, you didn't cook, you didn't check your phone, you just spent time with God and with your family. Can you imagine that? When was the la- I'm not even going to ask when the last time you did that was. But that's kind of his point, that the Jews did that every single week. They did nothing for an entire day that they could think and be with God and praise him and have fun and, and do the things to recharge themselves. And we wonder why we're so stressed out. One of the things that they even did was every day at 3 in the afternoon, they had a time of prayer that was kind of with the afternoon sacrifice. So even during the day, they took a break to be with God. And that's one of the things that he advocates in this book is to take time, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day to just think about God. Just think about a scripture. Just get recharged and refocused on what we're doing. He shares a lot of... Stories that we're, you're going to probably think are kind of hokey about monks up in the hills and about people that you know, go silent for like weeks at a time. And you might think it's kind of strange, but trust me, there's something there. There's a treasure to be offered if we're willing to find it and we're ready to simplify our lives. When you look at It said Martha was distracted and worried and taking care of all the things. It says she was even upset by other things. It makes you feel like she was maybe upset by even other things that had nothing to do with the dinner. And I don't know all that went into it, her personality and her experiences and her gifts. And it seems like Martha is the oldest, so she was probably in charge. It said that she was the one that invited Jesus over, so she was probably the matriarch of the house, and he had Mary, and maybe uh, Lazarus, the one that was healed. Maybe he was the younger brother or something. But it says she was upset with all kinds of other things. What are some of the things that we can allow ourselves to get upset about? Finances and relationships and even good things. Like, I wonder how other people are doing spiritually, and I haven't maybe seen him uh, around as much, and so we can, we can worry and we can go to the worst case scenario. And, and you know, when I look at this, it, it seems like Martha is an Enneagram number one, if you've ever seen that. So there's always something to do and there's always something out of place, and she's getting it all taken care of. And it, she even comes to Jesus and says, I'm doing this all by myself. Jesus, can you just tell her to do her share? You know, it wasn't fair. And I don't know if, you know, I know a lot of you guys have hosted before, but imagine having your boss over to dinner. And you want to get everything just right, and you want everything to be all lined up, and 
you know, everything's clean and you got candles and music and the food and imagine having Jesus over how awesome you would want it to be. And they're in a culture that values hospitality, so it's even a higher pressure. And then you have Mary not helping. Just sitting, hanging out. Sisters running around in the background. I'm sure she's giving her some looks and some, get over, get, you know, getting her to, and Mary just hanging out with Jesus. And think about how much judgment was coming her way. She's irresponsible. She's lazy. She's a slacker. She doesn't even care, want to make it special for Jesus. I mean, look at this floor. I mean, I can't, she, obviously they didn't even sweep the floor. And Jesus didn't even care about any of that. But that takes a lot of, pre, a lot of strength to do what is right, to simplify your life to be close to God and not care about all that other stuff. You know, as I've been reflecting on this book in the past uh, few months, I realized a number of things. Number one, uh, one of them is that my life is ruled by fear. I already talked about that, right? Yeah. You know, I realized different things even with my sister and just the connections that we had and some of the tension that was not coming from her, it was coming from me and some of the pride and, and just realizing, wow, God is helping us to get deeper. But I can't even imagine just sitting down with, Jesus, when there's all this stuff going on at my house, it would, that, that's almost unfathomable to have that kind of connection with Christ that she was willing to let things go to be with him. And I'm sure she wasn't a slacker all the time, but at this time, that, that was the priority. You know, how good at we are sim at simplifying our lives? How good at, are we with our friends that want to simplify their lives? Because what that means is that they're going to have to say no to some things, including you. They can't get with you because they need to spend time here. Or they, their marriage needs work. Or they, their kids are only in town for a little while. Or it's super stressful at work. Or you're like Juan and you worked 20 hours last night and you got to get home. But there's a respect. There's a, a, an honoring. But it takes a lot to say no. Because right? what happens when you say no as a Christian? What did I say before? You're lazy. You're not, you're, you don't help. You're not doing your share. You're, you know? So to be close to Jesus, there may be some people even in here that think you're not doing real good. Mary didn't seem to care, and neither did Jesus. But that's a hard thing to do. We're all familiar with this passage where Jesus calls his first disciple, he says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What does that mean? What we're all familiar with is that means that we're helping people come to Christ, we're helping people be saved, we're thinking about our relationships, how we can get people closer to him. When I read through the Gospels, I don't see, I see about one lesson on that when he sends out the 72 and tells them what to do and how to do it. And other than that, there's not a whole lot of X, Y, and Z of how to help people be saved. And, but there is a lot of Jesus getting into their lives, people helping them to change their characters. He challenges them on their faith. He encourages them a number of times not to be afraid. Why? Because they were fearful. Yeah. There was, they were terrified. If you could just read the Gospels, and how would you feel? You'd be afraid almost every day. People want to kill Jesus. People want to throw him off a, a mountain. You're in, a, you're in this lake. You're going to drown. He's putting pressure on you to feed all these people, and you don't know what to do. I mean, you're feeling a lot of fear. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. He's helping to change their character. As I mentioned before, he, he doesn't want them to be servants. He wants them to be friends. He wants them to be with him. I don't think this was a, 
the call that we've always thought it was. It was a call to be, Jesus is choosing me to live with him, to be around him, to be close to him. Yeah, we're going to help, help other people know him along the way, but the call was to be with Christ before it was to catch fish. And that's something that, that, that really helped me to understand what it means, what our goal is even in this life as Christians, to be with Christ. I put together uh, from the book here the discipleship untop 10 or the unhealthy emotional spirituality things here. And I just kind of wrote them down just so you get a flavor of what's going on. But I wanted to think about these things in terms of Mary and Martha. Okay, it says that sometimes we can use God to run from God. Now, what does that look like in this story? Maybe Martha is trying to be a good disciple and trying to help out and trying to get everything ready, and yet in that same way, she's not close to God. That we can be so busy for God that we're not doing it out of the, that heart that he wants us to have. We're not having that spirituality behind it. You know, ignoring anger, sadness, and fear. You know, Martha had a lot of that. Anger, fear, stress. We call it stress, right? It's anger, fear, all those disappointment. And yet she didn't seem like she was really taking it to Jesus to really get rid of it. It was just kind of building up. If you just stop, I've, I've just had times because of this last uh, month or so, just thinking about, wow, how many things come my way and do I deal with them spiritually or do I just pile them on? And that can be from a phone call to a meeting to a time to, you know, whatever. But we have so many things coming our way that we just end up piling it all on and by the end of the day we're carrying around this big train full of stuff. And God wants us to be able to take those things to him and deal with our hearts and get rid of anger, sadness, fear. I mean, we live in a, even a Christian culture, not even just with our church, that it's kind of rejoice always, right? Isn't that the favorite verse? Second favorite verse for kids. One is children obey your parents. <laughs> and the second one is rejoice always, right? Or as my kids said it, you know, Philippians 4.4, 4, be happy, right? That's pretty much the gist of it. You know, that was the, you know, the, the four-year-old version of it. And there's some good to that. But when that is who we all feel like we need to be all the time, that's just not real. That's not good. You've had a tragedy happen, but you gotta, just got to be happy. That's fake. That's what that is. You know, <laughs> oh gosh, I won't tell you what movie it was from, but uh, you know, <laughs> there was this lady and she had everything going on in her life. Her family was falling apart and she was in tears and she's like, I am so blessed. And she's like crying and saying, because she's a Christian, she's so blessed. And I'm just like, that's us, right? The world is falling down and we're just like, I'm so blessed. And we just really need to have a good cry. Or we need to be honest with God about the things that we're angry about. Amen. A lot of us, I look around, we've been Christians for a long time. A lot of times we're angry at God. Yeah. That he didn't do certain things that we thought he was supposed to do. You said my life would be this way and my life is that way. Like, what's up with that, God? And if you keep, if you don't deal with that, then you just become shallow. God is loving. He does care about us. He does everything for our good. But sometimes we hide behind that and we don't deal with, so how do I feel about that? I know this is for my good, but it sucks right now. Sorry to use that word if you don't like that word, but that's, that's real. God, this isn't what I want. I don't like this relationship. I don't like that I'm alone. I don't like this. I don't like my finances. I don't like whatever. And that's the beginning of a really good conversation. 
That's what the Psalms were all about. Most of them started that way, and they end up better, but not if we don't talk. Not if we don't talk. Amen. You can look at the rest of these things. I'm not going to get into all those, but uh, living without limits, that's another good one. You know, God has put us in this life that we have certain limits and things that we can control and things that we can't control. Any of you who are parents, you're familiar with this principle, right? When they're little, you can kind of control them, and then as they get older, they get less and less in your control, and finally, you have nothing. You have an influence, but they can always hang up the phone on you if they don't want to hear it anymore. (laughs) But sometimes we feel like we want to control everything, that how people around us are doing is because of you. How your friends are doing spiritually is because you didn't do this and you didn't have this conversation with them and you didn't pray for them enough and you didn't try to help them enough. Do you see how that sounds? Yeah, we're in community. We want to help one another. But ultimately, it's, it's you and God. It's me and God. I don't stand up there with anybody. And neither do you. And sometimes even we're so conscientious as Christians that we try to carry everybody's burden all the way to heaven. And it's killing some of us because we don't have good limits. We're not able to say, you know what, I've done all I can do. I'm going to pray for this person. I'm going to help them if they want, you know, whatever. They're the, I'm there. But I'm not going to base my joy and my happiness on how you're doing. That's that's codependency spiritually, we won't get into all that, but it's just not healthy. And it's so much more freeing when we recognize, you know what, God? You're in control of that. My kids are halfway, they're all the way across the country. I can pray for them, I can talk to them on the phone, and then I just got to say, you know what, God? You got this, (laughs) because I know I don't. And he's like, yeah, that's in a lot more situations than just when your kids are across the country. I got a lot more than you think I have from from his perspective. So to simplify our lives, and let's, uh, we won't read that again. This is the, the, the graph that he showed there earlier. And just think about your life. How are you doing in these five areas? Emotionally, socially, intellectually, spiritually, and physically. And sometimes we just think about how we're doing spiritually and all that, and we, we kind of ignore a lot of other stuff. That's a part of who we are. You may be familiar with There's a lot of different. This is the wellness wheel of, of the Emotionally Healthy Spiritual book, but this is very common to think about. And, um, you know, this past week, kind of an interesting, even as I'm thinking about this, I went... I was thinking about phys- the physical side of myself, and I went and I got my third manicure, my third pedicure ever, and my first pedicure. Third pedicure and first manicure, okay? The guys are looking at me kind of funny, like Herman. But uh, I was just thinking about it. I was just kind of praying, thinking with God, and I'm like, man, I got a pedicure my first time at my wedding. 25 years ago, and I was like, hey, we're going to celebrate. I'm going to do it. I went down there, had the greatest guy ever. He didn't talk to me at all. It was so great. I didn't, no chit-chat. I just read my book. He did his thing. I gave him a good tip. I was fired up. But just taking time for yourself to take care of yourself. Just a little thing. What, what, what does that mean for you? I don't know to take time to just sit and meditate with God, to sing songs. I haven't done a lot of these things in a while. Just starting to practice like, wow, there's a lot that I, I'm not good at this right now in my life. Maybe I was good at one point, but I'm not real good right now. You know, I think of certain people that really praise God and and really listen to a lot of worship. One of them is Gabe Algara up here in the front. And he's always listened to music. I know uh, Cynthia Arnold, you know, she's with the kids today, but she sends different friends, like, a song every day. 
I'm like, man, is she just listening? To, she's just worshiping God every single day. I know my wife has been doing this a lot more in the last five years, just listening to music, Christian music it, around the house. And so I'm excited, and hopefully you are, to get closer to God. And let's see how we're doing. We're about, we're about done here. Um, I'll just give you the last couple points here. You can read this story for yourself. Two, to prioritize. And that's what Ma Mary did. She prioritized her relationship with Jesus. And he encouraged her for that. He said, this will not, you know, Mary has chosen what is better. That you, we need to think about our lives in all areas and think about what are the most important things that I got to do? Who do I need to be with? How do I need to live my life? And we need to do those. Yeah. You know, to get to the end of our lives and not spend the right time with our families and our spouses and our kids and all the most important people to us, then that, that's not good. That's not what we want, right? But it's easy to get out of balance yeah. and prioritize the little things and miss out on Jesus. We want to be close to God. We want to grow spiritually, but do we really want it? Are we going to prioritize that? Is it more important than whatever? That show or that game or that extra overtime or whatever it is to put Jesus first and put those relationships back where they need to be. And that's th that we all need to figure out and pray about with God. And number three is to choose relationships over our to-do list. She chose her relationship with Jesus. She chose, we, we need to choose the relationships around us and not all the jobs that we got to get done. You know, she said she chose to sit at his feet. She chose to walk with Christ, to be at peace with him in the midst of everybody else and what they thought of her. And she is an example to all of us. I pray that even now that you're thinking about how can I be with God more? How can I spend time with him? And not more in the sense that I need to have more minutes or more whatever, but how can I get closer to God? How can I spend time with him? To simp how can I simplify my life? A lot of people are doing it to decide to simplify their life, but it's not easy. But it's not unattainable either. In every one of our situations, we can simplify our lives enough to be close to Jesus. Amen. We can make decisions to prioritize our lives, to get closer to, to him, to, to make important all these areas of our lives that we need to focus on. That it's not an excuse that it's too hard. That we, we, make, we make our own schedules. We make our own decisions of where we're going to spend our time. We can't blame that on anyone else. We have to look at ourselves and say, how do I want to live my life? What are the priorities that I'm going to do? And how can I change them for the better for God? And maybe you're not going to change everything, but change something to be closer to him. How can I prioritize relationships over tasks and projects and to-do lists? And as we take communion, I'm drawn to this passage by Christ. And to think about, is this your life? It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus offers rest and gentleness and an easy yoke and light burdens. I'm not talking about an easy life because Jesus went to the cross. But I'm talking about being close to him that he bears our burdens that we don't go through it alone. I've seen people in unimaginable situations be at peace with Christ. 
it wasn't because it was easy. It was because of where they were in their walk with him. And he, they, they were yoked up with him that their burdens felt light. We need this. I need this. You need this. To simplify, to prioritize, and to be in that relationship with Christ. That's resting and gentle and easy and light. Let's pray as we take communion and begin our journey to God leading us in our relationship with him. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for this time. We, I just thank you for a chance to get deeper with you, for a chance to grow, a chance to reflect, a chance to bring our burdens and our fears and whatever it is under the surface, bring it to you. God, I pray that this today and this fall that you expose us that you help us to get deeper, that you help us to be honest, that you help us to have courage and ultimately to have faith that whatever it is that we find that we can overcome with you, that you're the one that's guiding us and leading us and helping us. God, I pray that we can find rest for our souls in you. Thank you for your body and your blood that you shed for us. Thank you for the cleanness that you offer us, the, the 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 guilt-free life that you put out before us, God. Thank you that you promise that you'll always be with us and that we'll never have to be afraid. God, we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.